Yale Brothers, episode 60. Six zero. <laughs> Bag of bones, I'll be raising up a rug still there. Everybody, my name's Chris, and I'm Roger, and we're the Yale Brothers. Happy to be here again. Yes, indeed, and happy to be offering you our 60th episode. And uh, boy, do we have a great! Uh, we're going to finish up our conversation with Sidney Bullins, part two. That is absolutely true. And what you just heard was a song called "Lucky for Me" uh, from Sidney's 2020 album "Walking Through This World." Yep, great. Oh, man, that's a rock and roll number right there, isn't it? Yes, and what a great chat we had last time. I'm sorry we we had to cut it short, but now we're back. Um, Good, we get to hang out with Sid a little more. I love it. Yeah, man. I'm just glad he's willing to do it, and that's awesome. Sid is a two-time Grammy nominee with nine albums spanning more than 40 years. Chris, last week it blew my mind, and we had to start with uh, the fact that he was a backup singer for Elton John. Sure. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, all right. And he's got two lead vocals on the Grease movie soundtrack. And, yeah. And um, he's one-third of a group called The Refugees with a, a fellow singer-songwriters, Wendy Waldman and Deborah Holland. Man, that's some songwriter ro- uh, royalty right there. I, I almost said songwriter royalties. Let's hope for the best. Yeah, I thought, I thought that's <laughs> may, may May they be piling in, but that's songwriter royalty right there, man. I love it. And uh, for part two, we're glad to to have Sid back. Wow. Well, so uh, shall we bring him on to the show? Yes, please. All right. Here's our part two interview conversation with 
Sydney Bullens. Sid, that was a rockin' tune. Um, I should lucky say so. for me. Love it. Lucky Very. for lucky for me, man. Hey, by the way, welcome back to the show, my friend. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Oh God, yes. Welcome back to the show, Sid. Hey, thank you. You know, I feel like we're friends now. Yeah, me too. You know, it's like you know, I'm going to be popping over to the house for a meal pretty soon. Anytime. You know? Anytime. Come on. Come on. In fact, I was. I wish you were here in person, as I said when we first met. To yeah, do me the, too. Uh, me too. I mean, yeah. hopefully, we'll get back to that. I, I. Um, you know, some things I don't miss in person, but but this kind of thing I do. And uh, of course, I miss playing gigs, but uh, maybe we'll get back to that at some point, too. Absolutely. So, yeah, what is uh, speaking of that? What is the situation? Are you so you still it's still shut down or what's? The well, story? it's not so much that uh, that it's shut down. I mean, yeah. some of my friends are out there playing and some aren't. Yeah. You know, it depends on them personally, what they feel is safe for them or, um, you know, some, some of them have tours that I have one friend who had a, you know, tour scheduled all through the spring and then can't, you know, postponed it till the fall. And that's, you know, that's been happening all over oh, yeah. and over and over again. Yeah. Or they go to one and then say, no, we can't go to the others because there's a spike or something. Oh, yeah. So it's individual, but for me, I haven't, because I started writing my memoir a year ago, um, actually, I did start writing it a year ago, but yeah. then I took a big pause until I got a book deal. And then I, said, I went, Oh shit. Oops. Excuse me. That's good. Now oh. I got a, <laughs> can I say that? Yes. So now I got to, now yes. I got to write the thing, you know? Oh, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so I, I've been ensconced in that. And honestly, and truly, I don't know how I know that some of my musical colleagues can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. But for me, it, you know, I'm just so ensconced in writing the thing and I'm writing it. I am, I can write. I am a writer. I'm a pretty good writer. Yeah. Um, so I am doing it by myself and um, uh, it, I'm just immersed oh, I completely get it. and totally immersed in it. So I'm not planning on doing anything until this is uh, turned in, which is about three months from now. Well, very so, good. Uh, it's like a kid I, with know. a homework assignment. Uh, do you have exactly a, do you a have term a, paper? A, a term. very long term paper. I just wait till the night before. You'll be all right. <laughs> That's awesome. And do you do you have a projected publication date? Uh, I do. I'm. Not, it's going to be 2023. It won't be far into the year, but uh, it. Uh, I, I don't want to get too specific because things change in this pandemic world. But uh, the publisher has told me that uh advanced sales should be available this fall okay so for now beautiful. That's, that's what's happening for Be now yeah. beautiful and uh, in in light of what we're talking about a pandemic and wishing you were here in person uh uh the hgtc addiction and recovery series was is this a second year in a virtual setting and you appeared february 24th yesterday yes. um, how did it work out in the virtual setting how's the the Casey doing over there? What was it like? Casey, Casey is King. great. I, I love him, Casey King. And I'm really grateful that he's doing this kind of thing. You know, I watched a bunch of them. Um, he sent me some links to some of the prior speakers and some of whom I knew of and a couple I've met, met or maybe one so far that I've seen I met yeah. um, years ago. Uh, none, no friends of mine, but but people that I, I know of, and they were just uh, incredible. And being someone in recovery for as many decades as I have been, um, it's always uh, an honor and a privilege to share my own experience, strength, and hope with people, whether they're in a 12-step recovery program or not, and or whether they are maybe thinking that they might have a problem with drugs or alcohol or anything else or yeah. not, you right know, on. because, yeah. because it is, um, you know, someone, so, everyone is touched by someone in their sphere without a of doubt, either family or friends or friends of family or whatever it happens to be with someone who has some kind of addiction. And, uh, I mean, listen, we, we know we're sitting here, the three of us knowing 
that in this particular time also in in space you know in in our country in our world yeah um it's really stressful and so if you have any predilection to any kind of addiction me it's ice cream you know (laughs) ice cream and tortilla chips you know i mean that's it and i can do them together you know i don't sprinkle the tortilla chips on the ice cream but i can do one after the other immediately i gotta keep it out of that uh, (laughs) if i get it in the house it's all over and it it, it, it is in the house oh my god that's all sweet and savory it is in the house you know and and uh, you know i've made trips (laughs) i don't want to divert too far but all right that's awesome literally have made trips in blizzards to get a frigging pint of ice cream not a quart because if i got a quart it would be gone so you got to get a pint so that at least you know that you're limited in quantity know thyself yeah yeah i have my own addiction that's fair enough and my own predilection so anyway casey's wonderful the uh series is wonderful i really wish i could have been there in person and i i I do do hope that at some point um you know, I'll uh, I'll go east and 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 meet you guys and all. Oh of God, you. be an awesome. honor! Awesome, be an awesome. honor. Uh, we left off last time um, at just when you were getting into the Nashville, your Nashville experience, the Nashville era, I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, um, we were talking about the phone call you got from um, Don Was before you went out, before you went out, and the Roy Orbison tributes and all that. Right. But we kind of left it off there. And now we know, I mean, you know, we know you live there now and you've lived there, what, many years? No, uh, this is my third. I've lived here now in Nashville for two years, Hmm. Um, but I had lived here twice before. Um, I never let go of a property in Maine. I still have a little property in Maine. Uh, That's my home base. Um, And that's where I kept going back to from Nashville or vice versa, you know. Uh, so I've lived here three times. Nashville, since 1990, Nashville is when I first started coming here on a regular basis. Nashville has wow. been my second home, period. And um, uh, and I've had places here uh, over the over the decades. And but this is my third time as a resident, meaning I have my license says Tennessee <laughs> on it. I have Tennessee plates, as Tennessee. John Hyatt would say. Yeah, and man, um, I was going there. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we just got new ones too. Um, so I, I live here and, uh, uh, it is my second home and, um, you know, I just feel a connection here creatively, even, even in the pandemic, of course it's all changed or it did change. It's getting back. Um, so yeah, I'm here now, but do you want me to go back to when I first started in here or what's your question? The the question was a little bit of a timeline from the Roy Orbison tribute to move Mm -hmm. to, to move to Nashville. And then Mm -hmm. you started working with other, uh, singer songwriters almost immediately. Am I guessing? Yes. So I, uh, just to back up just a second for your listeners, yeah, please do. Uh, the Roy Orbison tribute for the homeless, because there were two. There was one in 88, which was black and white, which I was not involved with. Yes. Uh, that was a TV special. I remember it. The one that I was uh, involved with and, and invited to be a part of was uh, February 24th, 1990. <laughs> and. Wow. Uh, uh, which was also my daughter's fifth birthday back then was her birthday yesterday. Oh Jessie. God. And oh, um, uh, she would have been 37. God. And um, uh, But anyway, so that was at universal amphitheater in Los Angeles. And I was invited to do it. I don't even know how I got on, on, on the thing. You know, there were several people involved that who knew me and I, I got to do, I can't remember what I said last time. So cut me off, but I did Good. the pretty woman. Did yes. I talk about that? Yes, yes you did. And that's okay. awesome. Okay. So I did pretty woman with the, with the all female band yeah. of many stars yes. and um, which was a privilege, but then Don was called me and asked me to do a, if I had a solo song I could do. And I did a song I had just written called send me an angel. Yes. And yep. yes, a solo. Well, I did it with David Mansfield, my wonderful friend, one of my best friends who plays multi-instrumentalists and you can look him up, David Mansfield. He's everywhere. But anyway, 
So we did that. And that song propelled some of the artists who were involved, Amy Lou Harris, Radney Foster, Bill Lloyd, uh, several others to come up to me and say, hey, you know, we why don't you go to Nashville? You know, you sh- maybe you should go to Nashville. And at that time, I had basically given up on my rock and roll career. My 1989 album had, you know, bombed with MCA records, uh, not because of me, I don't think. Of course, I wouldn't think that anyway, but uh, yeah. because of the promotion department, just, just didn't want to do it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, anyway, so I was really uh, that was in February and uh, of 1990, and so the seed was planted. And in October of 1990, I threw my guitar and my bicycle because I was a uh, runner and a biker. Wow. Yeah, nice. Um, I'm still a biker. I don't run so much anymore. Yeah. And uh, but I threw my bike in the car, my sneakers and my guitar, and I drove. At that time, we were living in Connecticut uh, to Nashville, uh, having made some meetings with some prominent people at BMI, which is my performing rights, uh, organization. Yep. And, uh, called Radney Foster and Bill Lloyd. Um, and, uh, I can't remember if I called Emmy Lou at that point, but she comes in a little bit later into the story, but, and I ended up writing that week I got there. And that week I wrote a song with Radney Foster. I wrote a song with Bill Lloyd. Uh, Roger Sovine, who was then head of BMI, took me around to every studio and every at lunch with this person and that person. And Radney and Bill introduced me to other. And within the first week, I thought, oh, my God, Man. you know, I was. You know, L.A. was a place where what's your last hit? What have you done for me lately? Yeah, sure. Even, even as a songwriter, I mean, I went out there and tried after the, the um, fiasco of my MCA album, uh, which was my eponymous album. Right. Cindy, Cindy Bullens. Right. Got gotcha. Never knew that word until then. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, after the failure of that, I thought, you know, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm old. I'm in my late thirties. It's not going to happen. You know, it's just not going to happen anymore. That dream is over. So to go to Nashville and to have them uh, accept me immediately uh, and say, yeah, we'd love some fresh air, you know, some fresh breeze, some fresh blood, whatever you want to call it, to come in. And at that time in the early 90s, 1990 and going forward, if anybody follows country music, there was a kind of a plethora, an emergence of new sounds, Garth Brooks, Trisha Yearwood, Susie Boggess, um, uh, others who were kind of not traditional country. They were coming in with a little bit more, um, an, uh, a little bit more honest lyrics, if you will, or, you know, more emotional standpoints. And I mean, there was still the blood and the beer and the mama, but yeah, yeah. Uh, which <laughs> could, exists yeah. even today. Sure. Oh, sh- but, yeah. but there was this new approach and, I became a part of that, and and that was a huge gift to me. I should say that's a beautiful blessing. Now, it, I guess it probably felt like you came home creatively. Then, can I? Is that fair? It it it, it, it is fair to yeah. say that uh, because writing the song "Send Me an Angel," which I write a whole chapter about in my book, I just finished it because it leads me to Nashville. Gotcha. Uh, when I wrote that song and please again, stop me if I said this the last time, when I wrote that song, just go like this, just do the neck thing. Okay. And I'll, okay. I'll get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. He's doing it. He's putting his hand up to his no. neck. Yeah, but it's cool. It's cool. Cause someone may not have caught it and it's good to have the recap. But well, what I was going to say was I wrote that song and I realized that I only wanted to write songs that were, uh, that I could play by myself yeah. Yeah. without a band. Yeah. We got and that. OK, good. So so uh, anyway, so it was going back to my roots because I used to sit in my bedroom at 14, 15, 16 years old and write songs on my guitar. And I and it was kind of the same kind of thing where I was coming back to just writing for myself and be but being in Nashville. I also learned how to craft. I learned it how to craft a song. 
Sure. And not in the way of of um, having it be uh, really, uh, you know, uh, a light thing where it wasn't emotional. Right. But that it was like putting together words and and music in a way that was not just from my instincts. Gotcha. And uh, and so it was is it was a really learning experience. And uh, I also made some great friends. And that, that lasted, let me just put a period on that, from 1990 to 95. Sounds like you're supposed to be there. And, and um, please forgive me if I'm jumping into this because this is a sensitive. Please jump. Um, you lost your daughter, Jesse, to Hodgkins at 11 years old, I'm that, to understand. That's correct. Yeah. I am so sorry. And it was her birthday yesterday. That's Yes. Uh, yes. God Thank rest you. her. Um this is 1996. Yeah. Yes, she, uh, she, I won't go into the whole story, but just to say she died of complications from uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, uh, on March 23rd, 1996. And uh, yeah, changed, changed my life. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I can only imagine. N- no words, uh, Sid. Um, um a song emerged from that unspeakable tragedy somewhere between heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Would you like to tell us a little bit about how, I don't know if. Yeah. Uh, Well, that that's what, those are my words. I believe that song emerged from my being is what I uh, I've, I've said again. And that, and that line is so true because um, I did not, pick up my guitar for three months after her death. Uh, I have another daughter, Reed, who was uh, 13 at the time of Jesse's death. Just Jesse had just turned 11 three weeks before she died. And Reed was 13. And um, so I had another child to take care of. And uh, um, I won't go into the whole personal thing with my situation, but um I hadn't picked up my guitar for three months. I just didn't. And one day I saw it and I, I picked it up and I picked it up really only what I tell people is I needed to have something familiar and tangible in my hands. It was just something that I knew because I no longer knew anything about my world except that I had a child to take care of and another child was gone, vanished. And so I picked up the guitar and the song somewhere between heaven and earth emerged from my being. That's the way I put it. I didn't write it, so to speak. Got you. I got you. (laughs) And it came out almost whole. It started, you know, I, I can't even, I, you know, it's not like I even remember writing it. I just remember sitting down and, and I started strumming my Martin D 35 and, and it, it came out and when it came out and I'll just say this and then I'll, I'll go into what happened after when it came out of me, and there was a song, I was horrified. I was horrified that I had just written a song about the death of my own child. And the next thought was, okay, if I were a painter, I'd be painting. If I were a poet, I'd be writing a poem. If I were, you know, any other creative thing i'd be doing whatever they do i mean that's and i'm a songwriter so this is what i'm doing to express my grief and uh but but i also felt this tiny 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 little spark within me that creative spark and that was it i thought okay i've written a song I didn't play it for anybody. Well, I did. I came to Nashville at some point and played it for one friend of mine, Kai Fleming, 
who is a wonderful hit songwriter who was had many, 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 many country hits in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Wonderful woman was a good friend of mine. And she said, that's the best song you've ever written. And kind of encouraged me. And so three right. months later, I wrote another song called In Better Hands. And three months after that, I wrote another song called A Thousand Shades of Grey. And after I wrote the third one, I thought, okay, I guess I'm going to write some songs about this. I'm um, not going into the rest of the how the grieving process works and, right. and any of that. Right. We're just talking about the music at this point. Right. And, and so I came to Nashville again with those three songs and I gathered some of my musician friends together and I said, I need to record these. And the, I didn't have, I didn't have any reason to record them. It was again, something I was familiar with, something I knew how to do yeah. something that gave me some framework within to live so like an anchor or something An anchor and yeah. do something. So I came to Nashville and I recorded those three songs. A few months later, I wrote another one. The Lights of Paris after I went to Paris with my my best old best school friend and well, I'd never been there before. And I came home and I write a, wrote a song called Lights of Paris. And then I wrote another song and then I wrote another song. And suddenly you may know the name Rodney Crowell sure do. came in to be in. He was an acquaintance of mine, not a close friend, but an acquaintance. And we'd had talks and he knew about Jesse and uh we had some talks about about it after her death and uh beth nielsen chapman who is a wonderful singer songwriter very close friend of mine had lost her husband uh before jesse died to cancer in, in his 30s oh man and um after jesse died she reached out to me and so anyway we became closer and she said you know you need to talk to rodney and i called rodney up and I said, if I come to Nashville and play you these songs, will you help me? I didn't know what kind of help. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I just said, I, I just need you to hear these and tell me what should I do? And I came to Nashville again. I was living in Maine at the time. Jesse died in Maine. And I'd been living there for years by this time. 1990, actually, we moved to Maine. And um, uh, he said, you have to make an album. Now I'd already recorded the three songs yeah. back, you know, so I had three recorded already. He said, you have to make a whole album. He said, but you have to make an entire album about Jesse. You can't put any filler in there. You can't put another song that you wrote 10 years ago in there. You have to have it. Well, that meant I had to write three more songs because I had seven songs. I had the three that I'd recorded and I'd written four more that I felt were part of the package part. That's a terrible way to say it. No, no, I just think came we out it. of my, just part of this, these moments of grief and honest songs that came through me, not by me. Wow. It's a and, distinction. Yeah. and, and so I thought there's no friggin way I'm coming up with three more songs that have as much emotional power as these seven that I've already written. Well, long story short, I had kind of an experience one day where Jesse came to me. I don't, I'm not a woo woo person. Yeah. My wife is, I'm not. Okay. In fact, okay. she keeps trying to, you know, hammer it in, you know, be a little more woo woo for crying out loud, oh my gosh. you know? And, um, uh, but she came to me in her way and I wrote two songs in one day. And the next day I wrote another and I had the three. And um, and it became the album Somewhere Between Heaven and Earth, on which Lucinda Williams sings, on which Bonnie Raitt sings, on which Brian, at Brian, not Ryan, Brian Adams sings, uh, which Rodney Crowell produced three of the tracks. My friend Tony Berg, who has, is a great producer in Los Angeles, co-produced with me uh, three Phenomenal. of the tracks. Phenomenal. And it became... And then there's a whole there's a whole story, you know, I mean, I put it out as a charity record, you know, to to benefit the main state of Maine ch children's cancer program. I didn't have a record deal. I didn't. Okay. I paid for it. I friends did me favors. I, you know, I went into the studio. I did all the stuff. I hired everybody. 
Yeah. You know, and I had a whole album and I just was pressing it up for charity. And then a friend of mine took it to, he was a record company or had been a former record company guy and took it to Danny Goldberg, who had just started Artemis Records. Uh, and Danny called me up and said, I want to put out somewhere between heaven and earth. Oh, that's the Artemis uh, connection. I was listening a little bit on Spotify and I saw Artemis somewhere. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Okay. And uh, Artemis, uh, I was there. Uh, I think I was there first signing and then Steve Earl, but it might've been Steve Earl first and then me. But anyway, wow. they licensed somewhere between heaven and earth and put it out and it became two things. It became a tool for grieving parents and people who'd lost loved ones uh, or had gone through, because the songs were relatively universal, you didn't know it was about the death of my child. I actually had a hit single from that album called Better Than I've Ever Been. Uh, wow. So um, anyway, it became, my, it became a tool a useful tool for people, which was really incredibly important for me, which sustained me for 15 years in doing concerts for people for on, on this subject. Yeah. But it also became my biggest commercial album, which was weird. Isn't it my funny? My biggest seller. And, and, wow. And you know what? I, I love the spirit moved you and it happened and you didn't, you, you didn't, you weren't trying. It just, <laughs> it just came out of you. And I think that's the magic happening. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I love that story. I do, I do too. It's a, Thank it's you. It's a great tribute to your daughter. Uh, uh, well, that's what I wanted. Yeah. That was the whole point. But, the whole point was to keep her name, to have people know who she was. Yeah. And uh, that was my whole desire. It wasn't about me. But just one other point. That album was what brought me back into the music business Isn't that as so, an artist. That is, that's incredible. Wow, Sid. Tell us about the refugees with Wendy Waldman and Deborah Holland. <laughs> is that is you that know, too wait a minute, is that too weird a little No, a little it's not. There? You know, the thing is, thank God for the refugees, because thank God for Wendy Waldman, who I met in nineteen ninety one in in Nashville when she was living here. And I met Deborah Holland in Los Angeles in nineteen ninety 1990 or ninety one when I was out there. They didn't know each other at all. And by the way, Wendy Waldman, you can look them both up, wrote uh, Save the Best for Last by Vanessa Williams. But she was also an artist on Warner Brothers Records back from 1972 on as one of that California crowd, you right. know, with um, Carla Bonoff. And uh, she sang, worked with Linda, Linda Ronstadt. Uh, wrote some has some wonderful albums and uh, and has continued to this day to release albums and she's just an incredible songwriter oh, and singer for, for sure Deborah for Holland sure. I'm sorry what oh for sure I agree yeah yeah and uh, Deborah Holland was the lead singer and songwriter of uh, Animal Logic. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, which uh, Animal Logic was three people, Deborah Holland, uh, uh, Stuart Copeland of The Police. Oh, yeah. And uh, Stanley Clark, the ba great jazz bass player. Oh, what a trio. And Deb yeah. So that was Animal Logic. They had a couple of records out. Um, but anyway, they were, <laughs> they didn't know each other. I knew both of them. They didn't know each other until they got together because Deborah was a professor at the time and yeah. was and asked Wendy. This has had nothing to do with me. Asked Wendy back in night. Uh, sorry, 2006 to come and do one of her classes as a, you know, guest artist. And um, they knew each other very peripherally and they got together and they came and they they got together and started doing some, you know, things together on, you know, just going in, so, on, in the round kind of Nashville stuff right. together. Cool. That's and with other songwriters and they came to Nashville in night in 2006 to do a songwriters festival. And I was living here at the time and I was doing the songwriters festival and they both discovered that each other, they, both knew me and so they came to see me play and i went to see them play and we had breakfast one day and 
they said to me, hey, why don't we why don't we do something together? The three of us. Incredible. And I'm like, OK, you know, and I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but I kind of I mean, I like the idea, but I didn't know if I wanted to be in a trio and I, you know, I didn't, whatever. Yeah. And yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, so uh, so finally, Deborah kept badgering me. And I went out to L.A. because they both lived in L.A. at the time. Deborah now lives in Vancouver, Canada, and has been there for 11 years. But I went out there, and the minute we sang together, it was magic. The second. And they said, I know. Let's be called the California Song Girls. And I said, now look at me. I have a mustache. Do you think I wanted to be the part of the California? I didn't have a mustache then, yeah, but I yeah, wanted yeah. one. <laughs> right, and, right. I would tell you that's awesome. Oh, that's and, too funny. And I said, no, there is no friggin' way <laughs> I'm going to be in a band called the California Song Girls. First of all, I live in Maine. Yeah. Or no, I lived in Nashville. Oh, right, at the time. right, right. I don't live in California. So, I did, but I don't now. I did right. way back in the day. So that was shot I said, down. And second of all, I I don't feel like a girl, so no. Yeah, and fair so enough. I said, I said, how about the refugees? And we Googled it, and there was no band that we could see. That's called crazy. The refugees. Oh, that's... We've now found out there's a there's a Tom Petty cover band. Yeah, called that the refugees, may, yeah. Well, we, I mean, yeah. Oh, but I anyway, see. I see. Um, so we became the refugees, and let me just back up for a second and say that the refugees not only musically were important, and this just ties into Jesse just a, for a second. Yeah. And, and what it is, is about me. The refugees pulled. Now being a grieving parent is a long process. It never goes away. Oh Lord. I, I it can just only shifts imagine. and changes, but it never goes away. But the refugees, it was like this, the sun coming out musically for me. Now I loved writing and I was writing in Nashville and I was doing stuff and I made two more albums after somewhere between heaven and earth. I made, made Neverland in 2001 and I made dream 29 in 2005. They were both good albums yeah. co-produced by my favorite person in the world, Ray Kennedy, who's still one of my best friends. I shouldn't say that I have a several favorite people in the world, Fair but, enough. um, <laughs> But he's one of them yep. oh, and a true genius. And they were great albums. John Hyatt, Emmy Lou Harris, you know, other people on, on those records. Delbert McClinton. Now John played piano on the on the I'm, on the uh, title track of um, Dream 29. You uh, know, so I oh, had really my Sid, you know, that was a bullet yeah, point. Yeah, and man, thank I, you for okay, covering I, that. I, That's I awesome. I heard it. Something. Yeah, Chris, do you need to calm John down? Hyatt is. I'm a yeah. huge, huge John Hyatt fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. John's uh, John and I haven't seen each other for a long time, but uh, there was a point where we were, we hung out a little bit, did some things. His wife and I are still uh, friends and uh, crazy. Um, more Facebook since the pandemic, you know, oh. everything is, yeah, you know, at a distance. these of course. days. Yeah. But we, John, very, I, I am also a huge John Hyatt oh, fan. Yeah, phenomenal. And and he influenced me as well. So and Steve Earle, by the way, was on the Neverland album, and and I'm a big Steve Earle fan too. Me, me and, too. Um, and Ray, by <laughs> the way, shit. Ray Kennedy, my co-producer, was you know is the uh, uh, Twang Trust twins or whatever they're called, Twang Trust. Oh right, you, of course. Yeah, and uh, John, uh, John. Um, Ray just produced uh, the new Lucinda Williams album and he produced car wheels on a gravel road. And uh, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. So anyway, I I've been surrounded by some pretty wonderful, uh, incredible people. That's and the, a- but the refugees, because of the camaraderie, because of the, the, the harmonies and the camaraderie of those two. And Oh my God, we laughed so hard. We still do. So guess what? Since you asked about the refugees. <laughs> yes. On April 16th, I'm going out to Los Angeles and we're making a new record. Oh, you know? that, so, um, I was going to say far out. That's awesome. That's yeah. that's so awesome. So the refugees will have a new record out hopefully in the fall. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that at the moment. But we, we, uh, with it. you know, we took a hiatus. You know, I had to change genders and uh, they had to do some other stuff. So, right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! That's well, so yeah, so I mean, I bet when you get back together, you don't miss a beat. I'm sure. 
No, we don't. No. I was out there this summer and stayed with Wendy while I was uh, 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 helping to promote the the, uh, the documentary I'm in. And um, uh, we don't. We don't miss a beat. We uh, and Deborah and I are in touch. You know, we just it's you know, they're they're two of the friends. You know, we I, I am so blessed. Let me just say off off music. Yeah, okay. I am so blessed with the most incredibly supportive friends and family that I could possibly have. You know, I'm not easy <laughs> to be, to be with. Is that, you know? is that true? Is that true? Is that, is that, is that true? My transition was not easy on people, you know, and uh, uh, you know, I've just been blessed with supportive people who stuck by me. Man, God Doesn't that mean God everything? Bless you. That means everything. God bless it does. you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Incredible. That is incredible. It's incredible. Now, the, the it, it begs the question from a journalistic point of view, how your transition impacts the refugees. But bef- I guess before mm-hmm. or t- tying this in, you transitioned, you started transitioning from, from female to male in 2011, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, uh, and it, I did. I didn't come out publicly until 2012, but I did uh, start um, testosterone, a very low dose, because I didn't want my voice to change that much. And I also wanted to be able to reverse it if I didn't, if I got too afraid. Right, right. Uh, wow. Yeah. But, um, but I did start in September of uh, 2011. I changed my name in October. Um, and uh, But I came out publicly in June of 2012 with, a, with an article in the Daily Beast. Daily Beast. I read it. Daily Beast. Um, but then you disappeared for a while. Somewhere I've read that you were working at an L.L. Bean in Maine for a little while. Is that <laughs> yes, how- I did. I was working at... I, I, and funny because it does tie in with the refugees because uh, in 2012, uh, in the fall of 2012, after I had come out, um, I and I had been on testosterone for about a year, so I didn't really look a lot different because I was on a very low dose, but I definitely had started to transition and I had had what we call top surgery. Um back in may of 2012 but i still looked like cindy i still had hair you yeah. know i still i didn't have a you know it took me seven years to grow the the little well i shaved it a couple of weeks ago so it takes about <laughs> four weeks to grow in again yeah, it's but, coming in good <laughs> there you go I remember that it's coming Chris, in i don't have the, your Chris, genes get a little closer know. get a little closer Chris. to the screen <laughs> Because see, last week he it's said got, no. it's coming. I it's coming. I don't have to get closer. I see it. I see it. It's looking good. And so no. you'll see the pictures of me with a mustache. I just on the sheer spur of the moment shaved it off about two weeks ago, yeah. just because I yeah. thought eh, I'm just going to start again. Why not? And it does does take a while. But anyway, yeah. so I was in 2012. I still looked like Cindy okay. with all my hair. Yeah. And and uh, I didn't have any male features to be to to speak of yeah and i was and the refugees had a few gigs together and you know we'd walk into a radio station or into um a gig and half the people would know that i changed my name to sydney Uh uh-huh i was sid to everybody but sydney you know in print right and and half the people wouldn't know Oh, that's a trip. So yeah. as far as everybody knew, we were still three women because don't forget, we had started in 2007. Right. You know? Yeah. And so they would, and I would walk into a radio station. We, these three lovely ladies are walking in and it's not that I was offended. It wasn't that, yeah. I, you know, I'm too old to be offended by certain things. And I do have an understanding of, lack of knowledge that's, and that's and not is. not ignorance because that's a different thing that's a different thing but Amen. lack of 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 um perception or knowledge sure. or just information whatever. and yeah information and um and so i wasn't bothered by the fact that they were you know mocking me or anything no. or, or or had any ill intent it was right. that i i didn't i was like I was not Cindy anymore, but I was not yet all of who Sydney was going to be. 
Oh, so wow. for me, it was a really, I wrote a song about it on walking through this world called Purgatory Road. You know, I, that, gonna say, yeah, yeah. I was in, in the middle of transition, which everyone, every trans person who, who does do a gender transition goes through. You're not quite one and you're not quite the other. And so I said to them after the last get, we were in Chicago and um, Wendy had some other stuff going on. Deb had some issues with one of her kids and, and I was in the middle of transitioning and we, we both, uh, we all just looked at each other and said, okay, let's just stop. And so we canceled the few gigs we had. Uh, this was in September. We had a few gigs in November. We canceled those. And I went home to Maine and I said, I'm hiding. I'm going into hiding until I feel that I can come out as Sid. Like a like a cocooning. And I don't mean come out. No, like, I know. No, just no. You know, I mean come out of my emerge <laughs> into the world. Yeah. Right, right. And so and so I got a job at the LL Bean warehouse. What a trip. Wow. And that's a I mean that's a whole another story cuz sure. my I didn't know that my bosses from several different levels knew cuz I was a big kind of I don't want to even say a big fish in a little pond but people in Maine I was on TV I did charity work there, I did there you know is. I did all right. the local stuff uh, and yeah. you know yeah the local TV shows and stuff like that so people People knew who I was. Yeah, so they're going to be checking but, you but out. But I still thought I was invisible. Oh, Sorry, man. I just hit my mic. No, you're right. So, okay. worry about so it. I went into LL Bean Warehouse, and my boss. it turned out that a, a bunch of people knew who I was. They never said a word. Oh, my God. And until later, until I worked there for like a year and a half, by the way. Wow, okay. And, um, and, uh, and it was fantastic. It was great because... I was just a person, right? I was just there taking sock, you know, 15 pair, 50 pairs of socks out of a box on the bottom row. And then I'd go up and I'd get 17 lunch boxes from there. And then I'd go over and pick up, you know, a couple of sweatshirts and, and whatever, Jack knives, you know, whatever yeah. that L.L. Bean has in his warehouse, which is a lot, by the way, I'm sure I, man. that tripped me I out. Lost, I lost weight. You know, I, walking I, around. I, I I did. I got a Fitbit. I didn't need you know to go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, perfect. I like, Dual and, uh, so I worked at LL Bean, and I disappeared until Deborah Holland called me and said, "Would you come to uh, Canada with me?" And this was February of 2014. And back me up. You don't have to do anything. Just back me up with guitar and do a couple vocals. I'm going to do some gigs. I see. And and I I did. And then we we went on tour together and I just backed her up and she God love her. God love my friends. Uh -huh. They just eased me out, oh, eased me out, eased me out. And and um, and the refugees, just to cap that point about it used to be three women. And <laughs> Wendy, we've done a couple of gigs since then. And Wendy just says. You know, well, we were two women and, you know, and she jokes and says, you know, and that person over there who's, you know, she just makes some kind of joke about me. Yeah. And that's all fine because we're all self-deprecating self and we can all do that. Perfect. And uh, everybody, everybody knows now you can't, you know, I, I, I can't, I, nobody says, oh, is that a man or a woman anymore? Oh, I, I, oh my so. goodness. Yeah. They loved you into it, man. That's yeah, that's great. Yeah. Plus, I wrote my show while I was in LL Bean. I just wanted to tell you that. Oh, that's cool. I wrote my one person show somewhere between heaven and earth. I'm sorry. Somewhere between not an ordinary life. Yeah. Somewhere between seems to be the theme of my life. It's perfect. But, uh, somewhere between not an ordinary life was and that's when I uh, wrote the show. And uh, and by the way, met my wife, who was my solo show coach oh, well, that's <laughs> so really beautiful no, and director Ta and became my wife wow. tanya taylor that. rubenstein 2018 that's right. um mm -hmm. please that's so excellent the, can i have a little can i we have a little bit about you wrote the show then you took it out on the road mm -hmm. um what was that like and then meeting tanya maybe it can all be melded together in a yeah 
That's awesome. God almighty. Yeah, so I this was at, I was in Maine at LL Bean and I knew I had to I knew I had wanted to write a one person show for years but I didn't know I knew what the beginning was. It was going to be about Elton and Bob Crew and all my beginnings in LA and all my adventures and stuff. Yeah. And the middle was going to be Jesse's death and 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 somewhere between heaven and earth and emerging from that and everything. But I didn't know what the end was. Okay. And then when I transitioned I thought, "Oh, that's the arc of the story. The arc is starting in 1973 in Los Angeles, you know, yeah. all of that, getting married, having kids, living in Westport, Connecticut, being a, you know, just a regular married couple in Connecticut yeah. with two kids in the Montessori school. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then losing, losing Jesse and, and what that brought to my life. The refugees have a little, segment in the show very short but they're there because they're important cool and then into my transition but with with going and of course there are flashbacks in it it's, it's actually actually pretty well done and it's multimedia too this video and 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 uh pictures but oh, i'm well, sure it's awesome like it, it touched it touched i'm going to speak for you as well chris it touched yeah. us just the trailer the bit you have yeah. on uh, your site yeah How fantastic. i did film it but i filmed the first writing and uh, and then I rewrote it a little bit. The show debuted in February of 2016 or January. And uh, I guess it was February. And, and I did it through June of 2018 was the last time I did it. I, I'm probably going to do it again, by the way. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And Excellent. another rewrite. But, um, but I had to rewrite it a little bit. Most of it's the same, but what I did rewrite was was important enough and i never filmed it <laughs> so, oh god yeah. but oh uh god. so i don't have a film of it but we'll we'll film it next time but anyway tanya so i was on the internet because i knew i had all this material i knew what i wanted i knew the pictures i knew the songs i wanted to have in it and by the way there are eight live songs in the show which which create bridges from one theme to the next or they accentuate a a, a a part of the show. Yeah. Uh, and nice. um, they're all songs that, um, that I had written prior. And, um, I, but I was scanning the internet for ways to help me because I mean, I was a songwriter and I had all this material and I knew the pictures and I knew the songs and I knew the structure, but I didn't know how to put together 40 years worth of, ex of experience and eight songs into a 90 minute production yeah, stage. Sure. Production. Yeah, I, I don't know. How the heck do you do that? Learning I, I curve. Know. So I went on the internet and I found all these courses, you know, at the new school in New York and the, this and the, that. And I'm thinking, I'm not, I can't go for a year to, you know, oh, every man, that's too much. month to New York or a year or, and I just couldn't find anything other than books and things like that. That was. And when I use the word viscerally, I mean, that was, immediately going to help me that was going to that i really wanted to to have some help that i could utilize right away yeah so sure makes sense suddenly this woman pops up tanya taylor rubenstein in santa fe new mexico and she was a what she called a solo show coach and she offered a four-day intensive and she promised that at the end of the fourth day, you would have an outline for your one person show. One, I call it a one person show because I start out as a woman and I end up as a man. Yeah. So right. it's not a one man show and it's not a one woman show. It's yeah. a one person show. It's also called a solo show. So she yeah. was a solo show coach and she, she said, you will have an outline for your show when you leave here after four days. And I thought, Perfect. I want immediate results. Oh, you know, hell yeah. All days. right. Oh, oh that's, my God. That's great. I can handle that. And it was in Santa Fe and I love Santa Fe. I, I had, you know, traveled there several times. I played there several times with the refugees and bought my own and, you know, beautiful place. And I thought, sure. great, I'll, ha I'll take a few days. I'll go to go to Santa Fe. I'll work with this woman and I'll come back with an outline. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. And yeah. so, so I went and 
I did come back with an outline and and we worked on Skype boys. Skype. Okay. Oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. You've graduated now to Zoom, but Th- thanks, thanks, thanks to you, to you buddy. Sid. Thanks to you. <laughs> Skype. We worked on Skype for about 15 months. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did a uh, a, a live um, reading. My first reading of my show was going to be in Maine was in Maine and it was going to, in the end of August in 2015. And guess what? She was dropping off her daughter to Boston university from oh, wow. New Mexico, where she, Chloe, her daughter yeah. was starting her freshman year. And I said, Hey, come up to Maine, you know, I, and I wanted her to direct too, which I hadn't asked her yet. I see Tanya. I wanted Tanya to direct my show. Cause she yeah. also did that. And, um, So I had finished writing it, obviously, with her coaching, but I wrote it and she'd say, "Nah, you don't need that part or, you know, make expand on this part or, you know, whatever and help me create the show. Wow. So I was doing the first reading and she made a decision, which she didn't usually do with her clients to come up and see my first reading at under the presumption that she was might direct it. Yeah. And she came up and let me let's just say that that was when the idea formed that we might at some point uh, get together. And it took a while. It took a while. Yeah. Um, but uh, within uh, within about six months, we got together and oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah. And then we got married. Uh, so that so I would say, well, we've been married four years. Uh, January twelfth was our fourth anniversary, and um, so yeah, that's a that's a whole that's a whole thing. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That you just cute. never know, folks. No, that's man, uh, that's incredible. Well, the, then, okay, from marrying Tanya, yeah, the show, uh, Sydney. Please tell us about walking through this world. It's awesome. Your twenty twenty album. How's that doing? And what's going on? What's the story behind it? Well, Walking Through This World uh, it was an album that I had to make. And I kind of like somewhere between heaven and earth, I wasn't sure how it was going to come about. But I knew after I had written the songs for Somewhere Between Heaven and Earth and Rodney Crowell also came into the picture and, and said, you know, you got to make an album. I realized after I transitioned that I was going to have to write about it. And I wanted to make sure. a themed album uh, about my transition, which Walking Through This World is themed. It's a little looser than Somewhere Between Heaven and Earth being a, about my daughter and being a bereaved parent or grieving or whatever you want to call it. But Walking Through This World is themed around my transition, even though there's a couple of love songs to my wife and yep. so on and so forth. But uh, it... it I, I hadn't written a song in a while before that album. And I had a couple that I had written early in my transition, Purgatory Road being one of them, which I wrote in 2012. Uh, I, I actually kind of rewrote it later, but I wrote the song in 2012. I also wrote a song called Little Pieces, which is the opening track. Uh, that was the first song I wrote after my transition in, two, in 2012. And uh, so I had a couple and I had some other songs that I had little threads to that are on there, but I knew I had to write an album. And so I was living in, I moved to Santa Fe from Maine because my wife spent one winter in Maine and said, Nope, that's not happening. (laughs) So um, that's that. (laughs) So we moved to Santa Fe and that didn't last either. We're in Nashville, but uh, uh, because that was a little too far away from my little grandchildren and, other things for me but yeah we settled on nashville and we're happy here um so i did i i just i'll just say quickly that i that i did i was inspired after there's a whole there's a whole story which i'm not going to go into because we don't have time okay about the gender line and i'll just tell you the thread there's a line in my show my one person show about the gender line so I'm just going to say that I'm not going to say okay. the line, but there's a line in there that states the gender line, okay. what it is. 
that my daughter Reed said to me. And it's a very important line. So then I was filmed for a, 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 um, uh, a documentary feature called Invisible about Southern women, uh, music written by Southern women. And I was a woman who wrote music in the South for a while. So, yeah. and the director and producer came to see my show in Nashville, my one person show and said, we want you in the film. Okay. I'm a trans man now, but they wanted me in the film. Yeah. So anyway, they came up to film me. They saw the show in June of 2018 in Nashville. They came up to Maine in September of 2018, where I was living with Tanya and, um, Actually, I was living in New Mexico, but I was back in Maine and they filmed me. And the director said to me, you need to write a song called The Gender Line. And I'm like, I literally rolled my eyes. I and I, 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 I did. I bit my tongue. Wow. But I was <laughs> like, because here's the thing. I write love songs. I write songs about my life. I do not write songs about subject matter. I do not write political songs. I do not write protest songs. I'm not good at any of that. I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to preach to you. So to write a song called The Gender Line, which is so specific, I thought there is no way in hell. Just like I thought I couldn't write those other three songs, remember, yeah, right. in Somewhere Between Heaven and Earth? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, Jesse didn't come to me this time, but I did uh, get inspired. So anyway, he said, you've got to write a song called The Gender Line. And I thought, there's no freaking way I'm going to write a song. How can I fit in a story into three or four or five minutes that's not going to sound preachy, that's not going to sound glib, that's not going to sound, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, because I'm not that kind of songwriter. You know, yeah. I write from, you know, my my heart and the, my everything, you know, is on my sleeve. You know, you know where I am at any particular moment. Yeah. So on my way back to New Mexico, I had to drive my little Ford Ranger truck, which I'm still kicking myself that I sold oh, but yeah. um, <laughs> when I moved to Nashville. But yeah. anyway, it's another story. You can't get them. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I oh my uh, on my driving my truck from Maine to New Mexico. I couldn't get the notion of writing the gender line off my mind. I thought, all right, here's a director of a feature film asking me to write a song. Gee. You know, what am I going to, you know, and not only because he asked me, but because I, I don't know, it just kept sticking with me. Yeah. And I, I looked in the rear view mirror. Uh, to, you know, I'm driving on the yeah, interstate. You, you got road. The, yeah. I look in the in rear view mirror and the line comes in, if you were me, what would you do? You look in the mirror and you're not really you. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There's the muse. And I have always have a pad of paper by me somewhere tucked in the side of the seat or in the glove compartment someplace. I have this yeah. a little legal pad or a big legal, whatever. Oh, yeah. And a pen. I always have a pen and I write. And I start writing that. And by the time I got back to New Mexico, I had all the lyrics oh, for the song, the gender line. Well, oh. And I wrote the music after, which it, which I, because I didn't have a guitar and right. I'm driving. Yeah, right. I had like a kind of a, a cadence, a, 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 a kind of a rhythmic kind of thing in my head, but I didn't have the, the, the music. So gotcha. I wrote the music. And so that the reason I tell that story is because when I wrote the word, the song, the gender line, I said, okay, I now know that I can write again, that I, my muse is not completely gone forever as a songwriter. Clearly not. And I knew I could write an album. And from that moment on, I went boom, 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 and started writing all the songs for the gender line uh, for walking through this world. So it, it opened the door. I got to say. Believable. That, that song, it is from the heart and there's no way around it. I mean, it's just perfect. I love it. Thank you. Opinion. I love it. Thank you so much for saying that. I've had other people including some of my songwriter friends, just like Kai Fleming said to me back in the day, you know, somewhere between heaven and earth is the best song you've ever written. Uh, I've had some other songs since then who I, that I think are, are, are as good, but oh, no or doubt. at least as pertinent, but the gender line 
is one of those songs that, again, I was just the vessel. I was just there, wow. you know, and I happen to be that person who can write that song oh, yeah, for and, sure. and have it be authentic. And that's, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I the agree. whole thing Amen. is about being authentic and that's, that's what I'm here for. God bless you. I get where you're coming from and I, I certainly respect and appreciate you so much. Thank you. I'm going to say ditto again, but I can't let you go. Just like I couldn't start without the Elton story. This (laughs) this has nothing to do with Elton. These are two quotes that I've seen. I hope these are really you that I have seen in interviews, like print somewhere. Maybe, um, do you have something? I'm not sure. I don't know where, but um, one is if you live long enough, you get to have a chance to really become who you are. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Beautiful. And, you know, my daughter lived to be 11, but she was who she was. Oh, Oh my God. So it doesn't matter whether it's 11 or 71 or 62 or 59 or 46, you know, whatever it is, however long you live, 99, we get the chance. I mean, we I think we we all want to become who we are. And that goes back to being authentic, but I have been fortunate enough to live this long so that I could become all of who I am, which is what walking through this world, you know, that's the song that said, I'm walking through this world as exactly who I am. That was the first song that, that, that moved, that moved me before the gender line. Mm -hmm. But that, what you just said sounds Sounded like a great close and I'm not even sure if I want to use this quote but you did make you did have another quote now is this you too Sid who knew you make a little change in gender and life falls into place it sounds that sounds right I can't tell you I don't know <laughs> okay <laughs> but it, it, or not. it was so beautiful the, what you said about the first quote I was hesitant <laughs> yeah. to put that but uh, that's awesome and um and one more question because we'd like to yeah. play you out with um mm-hmm. sugar town oh that's yeah sugar town is the love song on walking through this world to my wife and i you know it makes me cry even thinking about it because i love singing it what now my it- wife and I are two different peas in two different pods but mm-hmm. You know, we have a uh, purpose together and it's personal and it's not personal. It's we are uh, the sum of our uh, what's that quote? The 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 we're greater than the sum of our parts. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh for some reason we're together, we were brought together and that's a whole nother story. I'll tell you another time, but, um, uh, which doesn't have to, has more to do with whatever else is going on that we don't know about. Yes, indeed. But, um, anyway, yeah, my, uh, so yes, Uh, (laughs) sugar town. I cry when I sing it. I was going to ask you that love singing it. I, I, you know, she has been the most challenging, <laughs> the most challenging thing that's come into my life, that's you know, in a decade other than my transition, you know, since my transition yeah, and oh. which was challenging and still is, um, but also the most, the biggest gift, you know. And uh, talk about being authentic and being who you are. She is, and uh, so the two of us together are quite a, quite a pair. Being, and and talk about being brave. I mean, let's let's put it where it is. She yeah. married a trans man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that's that's not. I mean, we can walk down the street and people think we're just this old white. She's not old. I am, but she's not. She's younger than me. I robbed the cradle, uh. but. <laughs> We walk down the street. We think we're just this normal white 
couple, sure. married couple. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Guess what? We're not. Guess, <laughs> guess what? You're, and you're, We're white, but that's about it. So check this out. Oh, yeah. my God. You're being Sick. authentic together. That's awesome. That's yeah, right. that is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, what a distinct pleasure. Yes, thank to, you, Sid. For, for you to join us both times. And um, I can't thank you enough. I, it's too. just, um, what a, an amazing story, an amazing person. You guys are awesome. I think you're great. I, you. I do feel like, you know, we're friends already. Yeah, and um, I feel it. You know, we'll we'll get together sometime. And I really am honored and appreciate that you've had me on your show twice, not once, well, but please. made it a two-parter. And uh, what you do for the community there with Casey and on your own with your podcast. And I wish you, um, I wish you all the best. Thank Thank you so much, much, Sid. Thank you. Holy crap. That was so awesome to get to speak to Sid, not once, but twice. Yeah, for sure. Oh, what a story. Love, love talking to him, getting to know him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you guys should get to know him too and buy this book that's coming out that's going to be incredible this is just the tip of the iceberg yes guys. um i can't wait uh the book is called Transelectric, and it's due out in 2023 as sid said earlier and pre-orders will come of course sooner than that but for everything sydney bullens words music shows other information check out sydneybullens.com yep all right, thanks to, thanks for being on the show, Sid. So we're the Yale Brothers. My name's Chris. And I'm Roger. And I have a frog in my throat, so... Uh, Ribbit. Yalebrothers at gmail.com. Or you can find us on the antiquated social media, Facebook. Yes, you can. The, it would be <laughs> funny if it, you had to look for something other than the Yale Brothers, oh, but just, that's yeah, not we, the case. What if we didn't tell you who we were and just say guess? Yes. All right, well... Love you all. Uh, We're the Yale Brothers and rock and roll. I got a problem with my thinking. My head wants to take me down. When my motivation's shrinking, I know I gotta turn it around. As I wander in the darkness, Hesitate to think out loud But you're laying right beside me Baby, take me to Sugar Town
My head wants to take me down When my motivation's shrinking I know I gotta turn it around As I wander in the darkness I hesitate to think out loud But your 